Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, Dr. Mankini, can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Grand Rounds and as per, per our usual routine um, with the virtual world, if you're on Zoom, you have a chat feature, you can send in questions for um, the speakers. And if you're on the media site, there's a bubble to also send in your questions. If you could do that during the talk, um, it helps us because they're, even though we're live, we're actually a live minus 60 seconds. And so there's a little bit of a delay. And so uh, if you want your, your question to be uh, heard, um, try and get it in early. <clears throat> it's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, two of our speakers. Uh, uh, first will be uh, Joanna Law, who will be our second speaker. Um, Joanna trained at uh, all her training at the University of British Columbia. And it's always great when you see it. Um, a place won't let someone go. Um, she went all the way through her gastroenterology fellowship there, but found time to do a master's in education at Stanford and did her uh, a therapeutic endoscopy and research fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Um, a newer physician is, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Mankini. And uh, I apologize if I'm pronouncing the name wrong because he's really brand new in 2021 to Virginia Mason and we haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. He trained at the University of, uh, um, or Ohio State University for med school and then University of Pittsburgh for residency, but then went to the Cleveland Clinic for um, his gastroenterology uh, fellowship. They're going to talk today on the genetics of colorectal and pancreatic cancer. And uh, Gautam, go ahead and start. Thank you very much. And I hope I pronounced everything correctly. No, you pronounced it absolutely perfectly. So. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I've been here for about four months, and um, these educational forums have been absolutely great. Um, so uh, both Drs. Law and I have no disclosures, um, and it is a two-part talk. I'll focus on uh, colorectal cancer syndromes, and she will focus on the pancreas, and we're going to cover these objectives. So to recognize the prevalence of hereditary cancer syndromes, to identify and diagnose select hereditary gastrointestinal cancer conditions, and then understand common themes regarding their management. And for my half, I'll have four parts to the agenda. We'll start with the basics. Uh, we'll talk about how to diagnose them in general, um, review some of them. There's a lot. We'll only review three or four. And then uh, the basics of management and the themes surrounding that as well. So let's dive right into the basics. Now, for all of us in the audience who uh, uh, treat, um, you know, cancer or diagnose cancer, we'll find that this graph actually applies to most of us. 70% of cancers are sporadic, so they naturally occur. 20% run in families, and 10% are hereditary. Hereditary means there's an identified gene mutation, or even if there's an unidentified mutation, it's highly suspicious of one hiding somewhere. Um, these tend to be autosomal dominant and highly penetrant. If you inherit the mutation, you're likely going to get the cancer or at least some features of that syndrome. Now, looking at it in a tabular format, if uh, uh, each row represents uh, uh, the various types of cancer, and the column on the right shows us the percentages that tend to be hereditary, you'll see that number pop up, 10%. So for prostate, pancreatic, endometrial, colorectal, or breast, they're very close to 10%, or at least the range covers that. For early onset cancers, uh, it's, it's uh, even higher. So for early onset colorectal cancer, we see 16% are due to um, a hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome. Well, what is your risk of colorectal cancer? So in the general population, um, it's about 4.5% your lifetime risk. Now, if you have some sort of inflammatory condition like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis um, or uh, a family history, it could be three to four times that much. But if you have a hereditary cancer syndrome, it could be 100% risk. So that means if you're born with it, you're going to develop colorectal cancer. Um, so this has a lot of implications for the management of, of these individuals. How common is it? So that being said, it's not that common. Uh, we all treat IBS. Um, and we see that in about 20% of patients, so one in five. IBD, or celiac disease, a little rare, but still one in 100 can have these diseases. And if you look at the bottom four rows, hereditary cancer syndromes, FAP, Calden, juvenile polyposis, or putz Jaegers, we're talking on the order of one to 100,000 or 200,000. So these are um, very rare. 
The Seahawks Stadium has uh, 72,000 people in it. If I told you, um, can you identify the one person with juvenile polyposis, how would you do that? So how do we uh, diagnose these zebra people? And why does it matter? It matters because it helps us understand the cause of that individual's cancer, but also cancer in general. A lot of what we know about the molecular mechanisms of cancer come from our understanding of these hereditary syndromes. It has treatment implications. Um, so uh, uh, for Lynch syndrome or mismatch repair deficient tumors, you can use immunotherapy and it's very effective. Uh, it allows you to determine the cancer risk in that individual and in other family members so you can help prevent it not just for colorectal cancer, but these syndromes increase risks of multiple cancers in an individual. So how do you prevent all of them? And it allows you to engage them in multidisciplinary care early. This truly is a uh, team effort. Well, uh, how do we go about diagnosing it? So I come right back to this graph. Uh, again, out of all the um, cancer cases, and here we're looking at colon cancer, about 10% are due to a hereditary diagnosis, the, the thin uh, pie slivers you see in the bottom right corner. So in a way, they're your zebra diagnoses. And zebra diagnoses have pathognomonic features or red flags that stand out. What we should be able to do is identify those red flags. We may not be able to identify the syndrome, but if we can find the red flag, at least we'll be um, uh, put on the right pathway. So what are these? Well, if you have a known family mutation, and an individual presents to you with cancer, that's a red flag, or an early onset colorectal endometrial cancer or any um, sort of cancer, having multiple cancers, either at the same time or at uh, different times over a lifetime, having multiple cancers or having multiple cancers in a family. You may not know what syndrome it is, but if you see a can family with three or four or five cancers amongst the relatives, there may be something going on. And for those of us who do colonoscopies, or at least read colonoscopy reports, we know as part of general screening, you may find one or two or three polyps. But if you start seeing 10 or 20 or 30 polyps, or you start seeing hamartomatous polyps, which is not the pathology you usually see, you see tubular adenomas, a light bulb should start going off that maybe we're dealing with something else over here. So let's start off with a case. This is a 30-year-old uh, with uh, difficulty swallowing and rectal bleeding who presents to your clinic for a workup. Uh, you uh, uh, essentially look at everything, try different diets, try uh, various medications, and nothing seems to work. So now you proceed to endoscopy. Um, this is a video of an EGD. We're in the stomach, and you don't have to be a gastroenterologist to say this does not look right. There's a lot of polyps. There's only clusters, there are mounds, and there's really no intervening normal mucosa. So my light bulb starts going off. And when you go to the colon, you also find a lot of polyps. And they're all tubular adenomas, and some of them have high-grade dysplasia. No 30-year-old should have an EGD or a colonoscopy that looks like this. In fact, no 40, 50, or 6-year-old should have this. So what do we do next? Well, first, uh, we get uh, a family pedigree. We find out about all the cancers that they have in their family. Following that, we proceed to genetic testing. So just to review some of the genetic tests that we have, if you know the family has a mutation, you can do single site analysis. You just have to look for that mutation. These syndromes are rare enough. If you don't know what you're dealing with, you either do next generation sequencing or Sanger sequencing. Now, Sanger sequencing we really did before 2013. That's PCR in the traditional sense where you identify a region of DNA and you amplify it and you look at the nucleotides and you see what, um, if there's a mutation that exists. This is slow, this is tedious, and you can really only do one segment of DNA at a time. We have a lot of commercial labs out there that now use next generation sequencing. This is, this is all proprietary, where they're able to test multiple parts of your genome at the same time. They run it on a panel. This is where that term multi-gene panel testing comes from, which I'm sure you've all um, heard or at least seen re reports of. And it's what we really have been doing since 2013. Whole exome and genome sequencing is looking at the entire genome or looking at the entire coding part of the genome. As you can imagine, this is tedious, this takes a while, and this is really only used for research purposes. So to understand how we diagnose these syndromes and use these tests, it's nice to kind of review the history of how we got to uh, where we are today. 
So the initial syndromes we looked at, and now I know these are all abbreviations, were Lynch syndrome, uh, uh, familial adenomatous polyposis, and much of the hamartomatous syndromes. These individuals, uh, three, four, five, six decades ago, or even a century ago, had obviously met some sort of syndrome. That allowed us to find some sort of molecular diagnosis and identify the genes associated with them. Well, then what we started seeing is that individuals fell into some sort of syndromic category but may not have had a gene mutation. So we started making molecular or clinical diagnoses. Those who don't have a gene mutation, we still treat as if they have the syndrome. Following this, we started identifying a lot other syndromes. Well, how do we know there are syndromes? Well, they run in an autosomal dominant pattern. So if your mom had it and gave it to you, you develop the syndrome, and they're highly penetrant. We start seeing cancers, and we started making clinical diagnoses. And as we, after uh, um, basically sequencing the human genome, we started identifying a lot more genes. And so the landscape of hereditary cancer is now this one big mesh where we have a uh, uh, we really have a loose understanding of some genes and a strong understanding of others. And it becomes very easy and cheap to just run a panel um, that's the next generation sequencing and look for uh, uh, all of them at the same time. So coming back to how panels work, if you look at an unselected colorectal cancer population, so this is all ages, and you run a panel test on them, about 9.9 percent, so again, here's that number, 10 percent, have a hereditary um, uh, syndrome. Now, if you exclude those with Lynch syndrome, which we'll talk about um, uh, shortly, uh, none of them met criteria for any one syndrome. So these individuals would not have been identified, but they're walking around with a mutation. So there's a lot uh, to learn in this field. Now, going back to our patient, um, they have an APC mutation. Uh, the patient with the pops in their stomach and their colon. APC mutations, pathogenic variants in this, is associated with familial adenomatous polyposis. How do we manage this? You know, the principles of management can be applied to any of the syndromes. So I'll take time to talk about FAP, but I really want you to uh, pay it pay more attention to the themes rather than the specifics. The goal is to decrease cancer incidence and in mortality from cancer well, or decrease um, uh, all-cause mortality. That can be done by surgery, removing the at-risk organ, uh, using medications, perhaps preventing polyp growth or slowing down polyp growth, endoscopy to remove these uh, polyps. Polyps are precancerous lesions that occur throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Um, or surveillance, surveillance of the colon, but surveillance of other at-risk organs. And many of times, they're extra-intestinal organs. You also want to improve their quality of life and educate other family members so they don't have to show up with a cancer uh, before it's too late. Now, FAP, or familial adenomatous polyposis, affects about 1 in 10,000 individuals. You'll see huge estimates over here, and that's because it's so rare. So depending on where the population, the research comes from, the estimates vary largely. It's due to a pathogenic variant in the APC gene. Now, this is a tumor suppressor uh, uh, gene. Uh, males and females are equally affected, and about a third are de novo. De novo means uh, they're the first person in the family that present with that disease. So sometime during embryogenesis, the uh, mutation uh, developed. And the risk of cancer is 100 percent. Most cancers occur before the age of 40. There is a spectrum, but that's uh, the average. Why do they develop these cancers? Well, it's nice to understand why we develop colon polyps. So the most common mechanism, 70 to 80 percent of colon polyps come from the chromosomal instability pathway. In this pathway, the, a cell acquires enough mutations over its lifetime until it escapes the cell cycle, it progresses through an adenoma, and then turns into a cancer. Early in this pathway, uh, so in the general population, you get an APC mutation. People with FAP are already uh, one step into that pathway. All their cells have this APC mutation. They get extra intestinal manifestations of, uh, um, there are extra intestinal manifestations in FAP. It is a syndrome. So after colon cancer, we see a lot of duodenal cancer 
thyroid cancer, and now we're starting to see Asian cancer in both Western and Eastern FAP patients. Initially, we only saw it in Eastern FAP patients. And now that individuals are living longer, since we're ta we're, we've, uh, we take out their colons to prevent that 100% colon cancer risk, we start seeing a lot of these other cancers. They also have benign manifestations, so such as soft tissue tumors, supernumerary teeth, and um, black spots on the retina or chirpy, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. You get desmoid tumors. Desmoid tumors are growths of fibroblasts. They're benign, but if you look at the top right picture, they can glow, uh, grow very large. So they destroy vascular structures uh, and they destroy organs. You can die from a desmoid tumor, even though it technically is benign. The colon, uh, we start seeing polyps as early in the teenage years. You can have anywhere from tens to twenties to hundreds of thousands in polyps upon polyps. Uh, you see polyps through the gastrointestinal tract. And you know, it, it really depends on where your mutation lands in that APC chromosome. Uh, and the APC gene is the type of phenotype that you have. We see duodenal polyps. Uh, again, as you recall, duodenal cancer is um, one of their risks. These polyps can be hard to see. They can be flat, tiny dots, as you see in the picture on your left. Or they can be very large polyps and grow around the ampulla. Now, for management of these large polyps, we really uh, rely on our therapeutic uh, endoscopists as well as our hepatobiliary surgeons um, to manage these patients and reduce their risk. Medicines don't always, in fact, don't usually work, and endoscopy uh, is not, it can be difficult to do to remove 100 or 200 polyps. And their stomachs progress over time. So we used to think they only had fundic gland polyps. Now, fundic gland polyps are benign polyps. Uh, many of you have seen them associated with PPIs, or, um, which we use to treat reflux. But what we're, uh, and we always thought that they didn't have a stomach cancer risk. Now we're starting to see these stomachs grow. Uh, they grow lots of polyps, mounds of polyps, clusters of polyps. They lose coloration. If you look at image, uh, B, you'll see this uh, pale patch over here, um, and we're starting to see cancer. So there's a lot to do. Coming back to the management um, uh, principles uh, and breaking them down into surgery, medication, endoscopy, and surveillance. Well, we do surgery to remove the at-risk organ. Most have their colon removed. If they have bad duodenal or gastric disease, we'll also uh, remove parts of their uh, stomach or duodenum. And uh, for those who have large desmoids that are leading to issues, we may also do surgery for that. There are many medications out there that look at various molecular, um, uh, uh, various uh, parts of the uh, uh, adenoma carcinoma sequence. They're not very good. We use them, we use them to delay surgery, but none of them have been shown to decrease cancer incidence or even reduce mortality. Everyone needs endoscopy, whether you've had surgery or not. You still have parts of your gastrointestinal tract that are at risk for cancer. And then you need to survey them for their other cancers that they may get outside of the gastrointestinal tract, such as thyroid cancer. We do routine thyroid ultrasounds starting in uh, the 20s. Now, how about the other syndromes? Again, I'm not trying to make you a hereditary cancer expert. I just want you to realize that these syndromes exist. Notice the red flags that stand out and apply these general management principles. So Lynch syndrome, this is one that we've all heard about. It's rarely de novo, and it has to do with a deficiency in your mismatch repair apparatus. Now, if you look at the top right image, um, it, it's a cartoon image of what your mismatch repair system does. Uh, DNA polymerase isn't perfect. When you replicate DNA, it makes mistakes. Mismatch repair fixes that. People who have a deficiency in this can't fix those DNA mistakes. They acquire mutations, and then they can develop cancers. Um, when they have a cancer that's mismatch repair deficient, we can stain for the, mis the various mismatch repair proteins and see which ones are missing. That's what the uh, bottom right picture shows you. Uh, there's four mismatch repair proteins that we look at, and if there's one or two missing, it gives us a lead into um, uh, what's going on. You know, this is, this is probably the most prevalent syndrome, one in 300. And as we're starting to run more panels, we're starting to identify more individuals who have uh, Lynch syndrome, but may not necessarily have a cancer. And that's why the risk really varies from 10 to 75 percent. And this table shows you all the cancers that they're at risk for. So if you look at the first column, um, 
colon and endometrium are their number one risks, but you also see st stomach, ovarian, the, GI tra the GU tract, um, and you may see pancreas, prostate, or breast. It's up to debate whether they have an increased risk compared to the general population. And when they get these cancers in many instances, if you look at the uh, last column, it's at a younger age than their sporadic counterparts. How do you manage Lynch syndrome? Well, again, you can do surgery. You can remove the colon. Um, if you do find a cancer, you do find a lot of polyps that you cannot endoscopically manage. Since they're at risk for endometrial and ovarian cancer, uh, many of them have an oophorectomy and a hysterectomy. Aspirin has been shown to uh, decrease the incidence of colon cancer, and in fact, all cancers in Lynch syndrome. Now, the first randomized controlled trial on this used 600 milligrams. There's an ongoing study right now to see if we can get away with much lower doses. Um, we can do endoscopy. Everyone needs endoscopy, whether they've had surgery or not. Now, the general principle for endoscopy for these hereditary cancer syndromes is you start early. You start in the teens or in the 20s, and you do it much more frequently. Frequently, These are not 10-year colonoscopies. These are every one-year colonoscopies. These guys can't have fit tests or stool-based colon cancer screening tests. They really need an endoscopy because of the number of polyps that they have. And we survey all the organs that they're at risk for, such as in their um, uh, genitourinary tract. I'd like to end by talking about some of our hamartomatis syndromes. So we've looked at those that produce adenomas, which are the pops that we're used to seeing. What about hamartomas? So Putz Jaegers is also autosomal dominant, very rare. 50% occurred de novo. Uh, it has to do with a mutation in the SDK11 gene. Now, this produces a protein that's involved in a lot of cellular processes, and these individuals get a lot of hamartomas throughout their um, GI tract. I said 50% are de novo, so how do they present? Well, many of them present with a large obstructing polyp or a gastrointestinal bleed from a large polyp, uh, and, and that's how they come on our radar. They have um, pigmentation of their, um, uh, of their lips, uh, of their genitourinary uh, orifices, and maybe even their palms and their um, soles. And they have a 90% uh, um, lifetime risk of cancer. Not colon cancer, having some sort of cancer. So almost all of them are going to get some sort of cancer. And if you look at the table, it's really all over the place. So it includes the pancreas, the lung, the breast, uterus, ovary, cervix, testes. So uh, it is a, a concerning syndrome to have. Similarly, you also have P10 tumor hamartoma syndrome. Now, this is, some of you may know, um, one of the syndromes that fall under this blanket as Calden syndrome. Auto, also autosomal dominant, also rare. Many can be de novo, and this has to do with mutations in your P10 gene. That's a tumor suppressor gene as well. And other features of the syndrome uh, include cancers. The table highlights some of these cancers, so the thyroid, breast, and renal cell, but also um, phenotypic features that are not cancer. So some have autism. We see macrocephaly a lot. In many of these families, you see a lot of large heads, and they say, we just have never been able to fit into a hat or a helmet. So that could be one of the identifying features. Or many have vascular anomalies. So in summary, when should you suspect a hereditary cancer syndrome? Well, count the number of polyps, and usually it's a cumulative polyps. So if they've had five colonoscopies, count the polyps over their five colonoscopies. And if they've had 15 or 20, that should, uh, a, a, red, uh, a, a light bulb should go off, um, and you should send them for genetic testing. If you see a lot of cancers or early onset cancers, if you see a lot of extra intestinal tumors, so you're seeing thyroid cancer, renal cancer, and then uh, colon cancer as well. And then if you see multiple generations affected in a family, especially if it's uh, autosomal dominant and subsequent generations are affected. We know this is complicated, and it's really uh, a pleasure to take care of these individuals and their families. As they go throughout life, they have all sorts of questions that come up. And you know, really, it takes multidisciplinary management. We need our psychologists, geneticists, genetic counselors, um, all sorts of specialties, surgeons to manage these patients. With that, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, 
interesting talk, and I'm just going to follow now. As I was preparing for this talk, I actually mentioned to a friend of mine who's a surgeon that I was going to talk about preventing pancreatic cancer, and he asked, is that really a thing? Um, hopefully by the end of this talk, we'll all agree that it is a thing. From a hereditary pancreatic cancer perspective, we're much less established compared to, say, the colorectal cancer syndromes. But by the end of my talk, hopefully, you will appreciate genetic mutations, familial and high-risk lesions that can increase one's individual risk for developing their pancreatic cancer. By way of background, over 60,000 people will be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in the, in the United States this year. About 48,000 people will die from their pancreatic cancer. And while it accounts for only 3% of all cancers, it is the third leading cause of cancer-related death. This table is from the SEER, um, showing five-year survival rates based on staging, which is a little bit different from the American Joint Committee on Cancer, or the AJCC system that we're uh, usually accustomed to. Localized meaning that it's not spread beyond the pancreas. Regional meaning it's spread to local or adjacent structures and lymph nodes. And distant, obviously, meaning to other organs such as lung or liver. If caught early enough, um, you can see that the five-year survival of pancreatic cancer of 39% is actually quite remarkable. However, less than 10% of our patients will actually present at an early stage. And as you can see from this pie chart, more than 50%, more than half of our patients will present with metastatic unresectable disease at the time of presentation, making them inel ineligible for surgical resection and possible cure. In spite of these grim statistics that I just told you, only 1.3% lifetime risk of developing pancreatic cancer does exist, is, what are, is our estimated numbers, and so therefore it is a relatively rare disease. Because of this, medical societies and agencies such as the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force do not recommend screening of the general population. I think we can all agree that the goals of screening should be to make an earlier diagnosis and therefore increase your likelihood of resectability and improved outcomes and prognosis. So ideally, we should target high-risk groups for pancreatic cancer screening. In early 2020, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or NCCN, came out with their updated guidelines with a section on pancreas cancer screening and genes associated with pancreatic cancer. In this new updated guidelines, for the very first time, it recommended that all patients with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer undergo genetic testing. We know that up to 10%, as Dr. Mankini uh, showed us earlier, up to 10% of pancreatic cancer patients will have an identifiable gene mutation, including BRCA1 and 2, CDKN2A, which is associated with familial atypical multiple mole melanoma syndrome, or FAM, Lynch syndrome, mismatch repair genes, ATM, which is associated with ataxia telangiectasia syndrome, PELV2, one of the breast cancer gene mutations, STK11, which Dr. Mankini identified as Poot Sagers, and TP53, which is associated with Lee Fraumeni syndrome. Historically, earlier, earlier diagnoses of breast, ovarian, colorectal cancers in patients with known predisposition gene mutations has been associated with improved outcomes. And the hope for finding such a similar predictive marker in pancreatic cancer, unfortunately, has been elusive. However, in this study from um, 2018 out of the Mayo Clinic, published in JAMA, they set out to look at the prevalence of germline gene mutations among patients with pancreatic cancer by running 21 predisposition genes in their series of 3,030 pancreatic cancer patients and comparing it to patients without cancer but the gene mutations. They were able to identify these previously mentioned six predisposition genes associated with a higher risk of pancreatic cancer. And you can see that in patients with a gene mutation and also a family history of pancreatic cancer, those rates were even higher. Of the 21 gene mutations that were analyzed, these six that were significant were identified mainly because we basically acknowledge or accept that an increased risk of over 5% lifetime risk or five-fold higher than baseline risk is what is identified as significant. What's interesting in these genes is, say, looking at the top row, CDKN2A has the highest risk of pancreatic cancer with a 12.3 odds ratio, but the, luckily, the frequency of this mutation is quite low at 0.3%. On the flip side, 
ATM gene mutations is associated usually with breast cancer, but there's this association here with pancreatic cancer. And in this study, these patients who developed their pancreatic cancer actually did not have any increased personal or family history of breast cancer, suggesting perhaps an independent risk factor. So why do we actually care about these mutations? Well, the NCCN guidelines in the same year also recommended the testing of first-degree relatives if it is impossible to test the individual with pancreatic cancer. The main reason for this is that 2 to 5 percent of all pancreatic adenocarcinomas will have a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation, and these tend to be highly aggressive at the time of presentation. So if we can't test the affected individual, first-degree relatives may actually benefit from screening purposes, and with screening, one would hope that we could find an uh, di make the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer in their relatives earlier, or even prevent the pancreatic cancer. Also, for directed therapy, as Gautam uh, previously identified, there's targeted therapy with some of the PARP inhibitors for patients with BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations in their treatment. So then moving on to another cohort that we could be screening are the familial pancreatic cancer patients. FBC is def defined as two first-degree relatives who do not have an identified or suspected genetic predisposition. In this study by Allison Klein et al. from Hopkins in 2004, they looked at the risk of pancreatic cancer in individuals with a family history of pancreatic cancer. They were able to follow 5,179 patients, and in this study, the risk of developing pancreatic cancer if you had three first-degree relatives was actually 32-fold increase compared to baseline. And if you had two first-degree relatives, it was 6.4-fold increase, and with one first-degree relative, it was 4.5-fold increase. Of interest, the median age for developing pancreatic cancer in these families was actually the same as sporadic pancreatic cancer at about 65 years of age. So much of the work and understanding that we have for familial pancreatic cancer, or FPC, comes from the work of the CAPS group, who in 2019 came out with their updated guidelines for screening and surveillance of these patients. CAPS is represented by an international consortium of gastroenterologists, surgeons, pathologists, radiologists, geneticists, oncologists, and epidemiologists from 11 countries over four continents. I can't emphasize how multidisciplinary um, our work is when we talk about hereditary syndromes, as Gautam has already mentioned. In our FPC group, they identify uh, familial pancreatic cancer patients as those who have a significant family history. So in the top, ro uh, top row, three family members with at least one is a first degree relative to the person who we are considering for surveillance. In the second row, you can see that there are two relatives who are first-degree relatives of each other, and one is a first-degree relative to the person being considered for surveillance. So, for example, if you have a patient whose mother perhaps had pancreatic cancer, and then the maternal uncle or the brother of the mother then had pancreatic cancer, this, your patient and all their siblings would actually be considered for surveillance reasons and would be a high-risk family. Finally, in the third row, you can see two relatives on one side of the family of whom one is a first degree relative to the person being considered for surveillance. So for example, if your patient's mother again had pancreatic cancer and say the mother's aunt had pancreatic cancer, your patient and again all their siblings would be considered for surveillance. The guidelines suggest that screening should start at the age of 50 or 10 years younger than the youngest relative with pan uh, pancreatic cancer in these familial pancreatic cancer cohorts. They recommend a baseline or index study that can be either an MRI, MRCP, or endoscopic ultrasound with grade two evidence for either study. Follow-up should be on an annual basis and could be either study again, the MRI, MRCP, or endoscopic ultrasound. And most experts agree alternating, alternating between the two studies, as long as no worrisome features are found. Most of us will also uh, check a hemoglobin A1C as part of, part of their annual surveillance. And if worrisome features are found, a CA-199 is usually indicated at that time. Changing gears again now to talk about pancreatic cysts. Pancreatic cysts are probably the most common indication for surveillance in our practice at this time for pancreatic cancer prevention. They're very, very common, actually, uh, as incidental findings on imaging for other etiology. In this study out of Mass General, 
up to 2.6% of CAT scans and up to 20% of MRIs had incidental finding of pancreatic cysts. As patients who are undergoing studies for another indication such as hematuria or trauma. I remember when I was in school hearing about this study and there, it was the radiologists were doing all these trauma studies out in the Boston, Massachusetts area for people who had fallen off their ladders while they were cleaning the gutters or something and then they were starting to notice pancreatic cysts as they were scanning everyone's abdomens. So, you know, as pain, we do much more CT scans, and as the uh, technology for CT imaging does continue to improve, the body of literature with respect to pancreas, pancreatic cysts also continues to increase as well. More and more pancreatic cysts are being detected incidentally, and, as, and historically, there was a push for resection of all pancreatic cysts. But over time, um, we've started to recognize that one, not all cysts are the same, and two, not all cysts will turn into cancer. So pancreatic cysts are controversial, but what is the cancer risk and which ones are at risk? In other words, do we have any way of trying to predict the malignant potential? If we're to take all pancreatic cysts into account, there's only a 0.24% per year cancer conversion rate of these pancreatic cysts. So then, when I see patients in clinic with pancreatic cysts, and you, and I, you know, I, this is my favorite thing in terms of seeing pancreatic cysts, but um, I start to ask, is there any possible history of pancreatitis? Could this cyst actually be a pseudocyst, and is this a complication of, of pancreatitis? If the answer is no, then we basically accept that this is probably a neoplastic cyst. So then I want to know, is the contents of the cyst thin or viscous, and, or like mucoid like this coming out of the syringe here. If it's markedly viscous fluid, this is often seen in mucinous cysts, and this finding is 95% specific for mucinous lesions. There are a few other ways for us to test for mucinous lesions, including testing cyst fluid CEA and glucose levels, and looking for specific genetic mutations, such as GNAS, which is highly specific for a, specific, for a certain type of mucinous cyst. This chart helps us understand the different types of cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. In the first column, mucinous cystic neoplasms, or MCNs, um, are seen. They primarily occur in women, they're solitary, and tend to be found in the tail of the pancreas. The second column, the branched duct intrapapillary mucinous neoplasms, are by far the most common type of cystic lesions that we see. They're evenly split among men and women. They tend to be found throughout the pancreas, and are multifocal, that meaning that there can be multiple cysts found throughout the pancreas. Serocystic neoplasms, or SCNs, meanwhile have a very distinct imaging appearance, are non-mucinous in consistency, and along with pseudocysts, tend to have almost zero malignant potential. So when we discuss pancreatic cysts and their malignant potential, we're really looking at these two types the intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms, of which there's the side branch and main duct types, and also mucinous cystic neoplasms, MCNs. The risk of MCNs in terms of malignant transformation is a little bit controversial, but it's anywhere between 4 to 13 percent in surgical series. But most of us will accept that with increasing size, the risk of, pain, of malignancy does increase with a threshold of about 4 centimeters. So once your MCN is greater than 4 centimeters, most of us will advocate for a surgical resection at that time. As previously mentioned, IPMNs are probably the most common cystic lesions of the pancreas. They, recommend, they, they represent essentially a field defect. So basically there's instability of the ductal epithelium throughout the entire pancreas, and the entire pancreas is therefore prone to malignancy either at the site of the cyst or even remote from the cyst. So they can develop a concomitant or synchronous pancreatic cancer remote from their cyst or at the cyst site. Main duct IPMNs, as pictured here with this patulous ampulla, is associated with a higher risk of malignant transformation. And when the duct is somewhere between 5 and 9 millimeters in size, this is worrisome for malignancy. And 10 or greater, or 10 millimeters or greater, is associated with a very high risk of malignancy. And those are the patients we ideally want to surgically reset. Branch duct IPMNs, meanwhile, are a little bit of a lower risk, but do confer up to an 8% uh, risk of developing cancer over 10 years. So those are our low risk lesions compared to our higher risk lesions. 
your lifetime risk of pa uh, pancreatic cancer with a mean duct IPMN is over 60%. So then when we evaluate patients with pancreatic cysts and IPMN specifically, I usually follow a pathway. There are multiple guidelines that are currently available and um, they all have to some varying degree of evidence or expert opinion. I follow this pathway, which is the Fukuoka criteria that was updated in 2017, where I basically first assess for high-risk stigmata of uh, malignancy. Basically, I'm seeing if the patient is jaundiced, in, if they have a cystic lesion in their head of the pancreas, if there's evidence of an enhancing mural nodule, if the main duct is greater than or equal to 10 millimeters in size. I then assess for worrisome features for cancer, such as presenting with clinical pancreatitis, a cyst greater than three centimeters, or enhancing mural nodule, thickened or enhancing cyst walls, all of which you can see on imaging, mean duct between five and nine millimeters, abrupt change in the pancreatic duct caliber, caliber with distal pancreatic atrophy, adenopathy, elevated serum 99, or increasing growth rate of five millimeters over two years of the cyst size. So all these things can be based on clinical, biochemical, and imaging findings. If none of these are present, then we can p feel relatively comfortable surveying these patients based on their cyst size as shown in the bottom row of this flow chart based on less than one centimeter, one to two centimeters, two to three centimeters, and greater than three centimeters. So as you can imagine, patients with a family his history of pancreatic cancer can also present with a pancreatic cyst or an IPMN that we're following in patients with known predisposition, genetic mutation can be also found. So um, one of these pre-existing conditions is not exclusive to the other. In the study by Nira et al., they were able to demonstrate, however, a significant increase in concomitant pancreatic cancer in patients with a family history of pancreatic cancer while being followed for their pancreatic cysts, their IPMNs. What's interesting, though, is you would think that in these patients who either had a family history or pre-existing genetic mutation, if they had an IPMN, they would be more at risk for, say, developing more IPMNs, more cysts in their liver, or in their pancreas, sorry, or more cysts, larger cysts. But this association is not identified. So there really isn't any telltale in terms of these cysts. They all look similar to someone, say, who has no family history or no genetic predisposition. So to bring it all together, 10 to 15 percent of patients with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer will have a predisposing genetic mutation. Because of this, every patient with pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma should undergo germline mutation testing because if found, targeted treatment options might be available. But also family members can also undergo genetic testing and if they are positive for the same mutation, may be a candidate for pancreatic cancer screening and surveillance. Additionally, careful family history should be taken because of this entity known as familial pancreatic cancer. These familial clusters have increased risk of developing pancreatic cancer in up to 6.4-fold when there are two first-degree relatives with pancreatic cancer. And finally, we have our most evidence in, and experience in pancreatic cysts, and specifically mucinous cystic neoplasms and IPMNs and their potential for malignant transformation. This is an endoscopic ultrasound, which is what we do, and this is a cystic lesion seen here in the body of the pancreas. Um, and then here is what appears to be a solid component in the wall. As we basically scan through the pancreas, you can see that there are these little balls of mucin as well, but then there's also this area that looks a little bit abnormal in the pancreatic uh, wall, in the cyst wall, and these are worrisome for a solid component or a malignant transformation. So to summarize, pancreatic cancer is a deadly disease, but thankfully it is rare and does not justify population screening. However, we should recognize and screen certain populations with the hopes of detecting an early cancer or preventing cancer with the intention of cur curative treatment. Here at VMFH, we're truly a multidisciplinary team in our approach to pancreatic cancer care. Identifying and caring for many of these patients, either with a genetic predisposition, a family history, or high-risk lesions, in requires input from our radiology colleagues, pathology, gastroenter gastroenterology, HPV surgery, oncology, and especially our genetic uh, counselors. Dr. Mankini and I work very closely with the counselors to discuss patients from pre-counseling, counseling, to testing, and post-counseling care. Part of my favorite thing about this is that while pancreatic cancer can be devastating disease, 
I do hope that we are able to change the narrative for some of our patients and their families as we move forward and gain understanding. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions? Thanks, Dr. Lai. Yes, I do have several. I have one for um, Dr. Mankini from um, his, one of his famous predecessors, Dr. Michael Gluck, um, who says, thanks for the nice overview. Um, can you comment on the overlap uh, BRACA with colon cancer syndromes. Um, I think you meant BRCA. Um, and also, do you see a role in the future for the use of CRISPR in treating families with colon cancer syndromes? Yeah, those are, uh, um, those are both very good questions. So one thing that's come from multi-gene panels, and if we go, if you think back to that slide where I showed a lot of mutations, we're uncovering a lot of mutations in the population which may not confer a very high risk of colon cancer. One of those genes are your um, uh, uh, BRCA genes. And so, um, so it depend and depending on the populations you're looking at and the studies, you may see a slight increased risk uh, of colon cancer uh, with BRCA mutations, and in others you may not. I don't think we're at um, I don't think we're close to uh, saying if you have a BRCA mutation, uh, you're at an increased risk of colon cancer. So we call these moderately penetrant or not so penetrant mutations. If we started reacting to everything that we found, um, I don't think we would have the capacity to survey or um, to manage these patients in any way. Um, in terms of uh, CRISPR, so this is, you know, a technology, but I mean, uh, uh, to really simplify it, to cut, basically cut parts of your genome out or cut bad areas out and replace them with good areas. Um, I think we're far away from applying this technology. It's a great idea, um, you know, and there's a lot to be developed, but it's still, we, we still have a, a very basic understanding of its use and um, also being able to apply it to one single mutation and not affecting other parts of the genome. But uh, um, no, both great points and um, a lot to be learned. Great, thank you. I have a question probably for Dr. Mankini. Um, as we've uh, seen in the last five years when we push for more, more general colorectal cancer screening, um, they've given us a lot of options, which include fit testing rather than the, the, what had been the gold standard of colonoscopy. But it seems like if we do fit testing, we're going to miss some of these people with multiple polyps, and we're not going to be able to screen. What are, what are your feelings about colon cancer screening in the general population with fit testing versus colonoscopy? Are we going to end up going back towards more colonoscopy as a gold standard? Um, and, uh, and obviously, for these patients that have been identified, colonoscopy is the screening test of choice. Is that correct? Yeah. So. So I'm a GI doc and I'm biased. I'm always going to say a colonoscopy is your best test because it's the only test in which you can not only find these lesions, but you can remove them at the same time. Um, so to answer you, the third part of your question, for people with hereditary cancer syndromes, because they are at such high risk, really endoscopy, colonoscopy is their only test. They should never have any sort of test. But when we look at the general population, you know, the answer is the, the best test is the one that gets done. And as you know, there's a lot of barriers to colonoscopy. Fit testing and stool-based testing, um, they're great. They're great because they're easy to do um, and, um, and they give patient choices. So, so I truly believe the best test to do is the one that gets done. That being said, patients should understand that these tests help you identify uh, cancers. They've been shown to uh, find cancers and advanced lesions, so polyps that are almost uh, a cancer. They're not good for finding your small polyps or your smaller polyps. And you know, that's, that's a, um, a, a debate that uh, a lot of people are having. So the best test to do is the one that gets done. For hereditary cancer, it should only be a, uh, um, uh, a colonoscopy. And um, yeah, if that answers your question. Great. Um, I have another question from Dr. Gluck for Dr. Law. Um, again, saying thanks for the nice talk. With increasing incidence of pancreatic cancer, what numbers are going to justify screening as per colon and breast cancer? So I think 
Thanks, Mike, for the question. Um, so I think that you know um, there's still a push with regards to uh, trying to better understand the implications of pancreatic cancer in terms of population screening. Um, as I mentioned, uh, greater than a 5% general population risk or over fivefold of baseline would be what we would advocate. Um, different. So I know that the U.S. Uh, PSTF came out this year saying that they never advocate for screening in pancreatic cancer, even in these high-risk populations, which is an interesting statement on their part. Um, ASGE is actually coming out with new guidelines with regards to pancreas cancer screening, and we are going to be uh, advocating for anyone with a BRCA1 or 2 gene mutation to have screening and surveillance. So we're not even there yet with general population screening and understanding when we are even struggling with societies and with agencies recommending um, screening in what we identify and acknowledge as high-risk individuals. I'm not sure if that helps, Mike, in terms of understanding or answering your question, but um, I don't think we're anywhere right now with regards to surveillance. Pancreatic cyst, however, gets you your foot in the door with regards to surveillance and screening. And now that everyone's getting a CT scan as part of their vital signs, you know, in the emergency department, I think, you know, we're seeing more and more pancreatic cysts. And, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, they're all being incidentally found as people are being worked up for other etiology. Yes, Blair. So I, have another, I have another question from the outside, but, but let me ask first um, a question. Specifically, as, as we develop the ability, and we have developed the ability to screen for these mutations. Um, in primary care, we're, we're being pushed to do these, but we don't know yet if it's mainstream or whether we should be doing this. And so the question is, when do you think I'm gonna be directed as a primary care doctor to do a general screen? Um, and also, can you tell me how much that costs? A general screen for genetic testing, is that your question? Right. One right. of the panels is Gautama talked about in his part of the speech. Mm -hmm. So I, so I struggle with this because there's, you know, here in America they do direct to consumer testing. There's a lot of different tests that are available, um, but specific to genetic testing, there are different panels based on your risk that we order from uh, screening perspective and testing perspective. So our counselors actually speak to patients, and so, Dr. Mankin, we as specialists, we basically take a very focused family history to try to identify what possible syndrome they're at risk for before we order um, a specific panel tailored to what they're at that we suspect they're, they might be at risk for. Ordering, I'm not sure that there is you know, there are like whole genes that you can start to sequence and large panels. That are kind of, it's kind of like ordering a CRP in someone as part of their annual physical. I, we're not there yet in terms of doing that. And I don't think I would advocate for that as a primary care doctor unless there's some understand or in, uh, increased risk. At which point then you should be thinking about referring them to a genetic counselor. And what about the cost of the tests? So uh, right now, for me in pancreatic cancer in our patients, because it is a guideline recommendation, it is mostly covered by insurance. Um, most of the current, uh, the, the testing company that we're using, Ambry and Invitae, do help cover part of the insurance costs as well. So that most of our patients never see with, a, with an indicated uh, reason for testing. They usually don't see a bill more than $100. They shouldn't see a bill more than $100 with correct indication. So if they meet guidelines, then they will get it, most of it covered. Okay, I'm going to push you a little bit. Can you tell me what the poor insurance company sees as the bill? Uh, I don't know. I've heard somewhere in the order yeah, of like $3,000, but I think it's quite pricey okay. is what I've heard. Somewhere between two and $3,000 is what I've heard. This is related to this a little bit, and I think you guys have answered this, but um, if you... Uh, can you speak to the risks associated in patients presenting with multiple gene mutations associated with these cancers, for example, Lynch and ATM? Would this change surveillance and treatment options? And I think you've answered that a little bit, but uh, if they have the mutations, um, are there guidelines for surveillance? Yeah, absolutely. So NCCN does have guidelines based on uh, their gene mutation type in addition to um, uh, recommendations. And then there's obviously ongoing literature and society guidelines based on the different types of gene mutations. So like I said, ASGE is coming out with, gene uh, with their guidelines for, say, the pancreatic, familial pancreatic and hereditary pancreatic syndromes. Um, but yes, there are guidelines and they're 
you know, uh, how we survey them and what we survey them for. I, you've got all of the icons awake already. So this one's from Dr. Dick Kozarek. Um, Hi, Dick. Uh, to, to, to Joanna, um, autopsy studies show that 20 to 25 percent have a pancreatic cyst at death. Given the very high number, who should be followed long term after diagnosis? That's a great question, Dick. And, you know, that's definitely a, a, a subject of controversy amongst our societies. Um, and so there's currently a funded study that is uh, going on, as you're aware, um, looking at the different surveillance guidelines, looking at low, uh, low interval surveillance versus a high interval surveillance, and we're not sure yet. Um, I think that, take, like I said, taking the family history, if there's a significant family history and if there's any change in the cyst appearance um, or if there's any suspicion for a syndrome, then we should be following those long term, knowing that their risk of developing cancer does increase because of this family history. If there's lack of family history or um, and there's stability over many years, or the patient becomes debilitated such that they would never be fit for surgery, one should consider ending surveillance at, those, at that point. Uh, so right now, the guidelines are still you know, up in the air with regards to how long we should be following them and, who, and what interval we should be following them. But um, hopefully, we'll have an answer in the next five years or so. I'm told that one of our young GI icons is in the audience with a question. Dr. Berman, are you there? And do you have a question? She is. Yeah, my question is, um, has the prognosis and survival of pancreatic cancer improved with our improving understanding of uh, risk factors, familial screening, and then sort of the second part is if we are identifying IPMNs and, and predisposing lesions earlier as sort of incidental illness, um, does that translate into improved survival for these patients? That's a great question. And, you know, it's... <laughs> it, the needle has not really moved in terms of survival with pancreatic cancer just because of the late diagnoses. Um, so, you know, over, overall survival and the five-year survival rates has gone up maybe like 1% over the past 10 years in terms of what you can expect. Um, and maybe, and that's with the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Maybe, um, as you know, pancreatic surgery, though, is not without morbidity and mortality. So it's significant. So, the, you know, with pancreatic cysts, when do we basically uh, accept to go ahead and do surgery, understanding that they should be in the hands of a high risk, high volume center in good hands of surgeons who do a lot of these types of surgeries, and then have a multidisciplinary approach in terms of following these IPMNs. Um, like I said, back in the, uh, when people started recognizing cysts, a lot of cysts were coming out. There was also a lot of morbidity associated with these cysts, and we're seeing some of these patients now who've had these procedures and surgeries done for perhaps, you know, less indication than what we would accept today. Um, so, you know, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of situation. And as I mentioned, a lot of these people start developing their cancers later in life when they're perhaps not the most fit for pancreatic surgery. It's a difficult balance, Blair, and you know, that's why probably the dial, the needle is not really moving far in terms of our advances in terms of survival. I have a question. I'm not sure exactly. Um, the, the question relates to the lifetime, the, the cost of lifetime surveillance. They didn't specify whether it was pancreatic cancer or colorectal cancer, but uh, any comments? Are there any studies that have evaluated that? There's a lot of discussion right now in terms of for pancreatic cancer. We're talking about annual surveillance and um, Q yearly MRIs, endoscopic ultrasounds, which you know is done under general anesthesia. Um, it's not insignificant, and again, it takes a multidisciplinary approach for this. Um, there are ongoing costs, and the, coming out in the CAPS, as part of the CAPS guidelines and CAPS work, they're looking at uh, the cost risk benefits um, in terms of uh, ongoing surveillance in these high-risk familial pancreatic cancer cohorts. So w stay tuned is what I'm trying to say. There's um, a lot Donna, in terms, I, I, terms of being stay tuned. I really tuned. appreciate it. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say there's a lot of work that you know, we recognize that needs to be done in the pancreatic cancer field and uh, surveillance field. So you know, it's going to, this talk will probably be a very different talk if, you know, we were to give it in five years' time or three years' time from now. I really appreciated your um, 
trying to explain to us about uh, the uh, cystic lesions in the pancreas. It's such a complex issue. Um, one question I had as I watched that, when we get down to the cyst, we know we have the cyst, and they have, they're less than one centimeter. Um, and so the recommendations are um, Q2 year surveillance. Um, if you've gone Q2 year surveillance for three or four times and they haven't changed, do you stop? Or do you still go forever? Right. So it depends. Um, and, you know, I see a lot of these patients with the tiny little subsonometer cysts who are worried. And are we convinced that these are IPMNs versus, uh, is, is it a solitary cyst versus multiple cysts? Is there any family history? Is there anything else? Like I said, um, so the American, uh, American Gastroenterology Association AGA guidelines recommend stopping any surveillance after five years if everything is stable. Um, some people will say, well, what if we picked it up when they were 50 and their family history of developing pancreatic cancer was 65 in their first degree relative? Are you going to stop at, you know, 60 then if you were doing Q2 years, your five, your three or four CT scans later or MRIs later, you're at 60. Um, you know, it's, I kind of nuance it based on the family history, on the patient's presentation and patient's indications, and also looking at that imaging. Um, sometimes I do try to increase that interval beyond two years. Um, there's obviously some nuance in all of these guidelines, and uh, it's obviously patient-centered. There's one last question. Um and I'm not sure if we have the answer to this, but it's a, a few years ago, the Hutch was developing a generally inexpensive total gene evaluation. Do you know where that study is and if it has progressed? And I guess the more general question is, as we um, improve our technology and lower the cost of genetic testing, um, is there a point where we pass where we may say that uh, in primary care, I should check their blood pressure and do a genetic testing? Uh, um, so to the first part of your question, I'm not aware of where uh, the Fred Hutch group were with regards to their developing of a genetic test. I'm not sure if, Adam, you're aware of any of that. So at, at the Hutch, they're, um, what they're doing is polygenic risk scores. Um, so um, basically, they're looking at mutations, many mutations, risk factors, um, and, and uh, they're at the they show that polygenic risk scores work, but they're very dirty right now. There's just a lot of data, and it's far from um, uh, real-time application. But that's basically, um, uh, but there has been a lot of development in the last five or 10 years. Thank you both very much. We had a fairly good audience on Zoom, and I can't see how many we had on media site, but we really appreciate your educating us on this uh, very interesting topic. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody.